Welcome to Are You Real, episode 67. Don't forget to check out my book, DIY Remodel Your Life, on the front page of areyoureal.org. And I want to read a real quick insert. It's a quote from Ralph Emerson. It says, The purpose of life is not to be happy. It is to be useful, to be honorable, and to be compassionate. To have it make some difference that you have lived and lived well. Roar Nation, I, my goal and the whole thing about this podcast is to help you find purpose. And for most of us, I know for 30 years, I felt like I just was kind of lost and trying to find direction. And once I applied some very simple things in my life, um, I didn't just find purpose in my life, but I started to thrive in life. And uh, and since then, these last couple years, uh, right before I started my podcast, it is literally just things, my marriage, my finances, my children, those things have exploded. And that is what I desire for all of you. So anyways, check out these very easy uh, principles in my book that you can apply to your life every day. It has fill, each chapter has fill in things to help you walk through it. So uh, again, love you guys and cannot wait for you to hear this week's episode. Be blessed. Roar Nation, we are back live and ready to go. I am fired up today. I got a special guest, Dave Sanderson. Check this out. So this is what makes this fun for me is I recently watched a movie with my kids. Uh, It's been a couple months. If you remember it, it's called Sully. It was with Tom Hanks. Great movie. I highly recommend it. But somebody reached out to me, it's been about a month, and said, hey, there was a survivor on that plane on the Hudson. Would you be interested? And I thought, oh my gosh, I just watched this movie. So I got to get involved in this and find out what's going on. And I'm really excited. So Roar Nation, that is going to be your guest today. I'm excited to bring him. Dave, are you ready to roar, my friend? Man, let's make it rock, Don. Thank you for having me. Yeah, absolutely. So Roar Nation, Dave Sanderson is an inspirational survivor, speaker, and author. His thoughts on leadership have made him internationally sought out speaker. When U.S. Airways Flight 1549, or as we know, the Miracle on the Hudson, distant to the Hudson River on January 15, 2009, Dave knew he was exactly where he was supposed to be. He was the last passenger off the back of the plane on that fateful day, and he was largely responsible for the well-being and safety of others, risking his own life in frigid water to help other passengers off the plane. All right, Dave, that is very, we're scratching the surface. That is something you did a moment in your life, man. But I want to hear more about the big picture of you and what you're doing. Well, well, thank you very much. Yeah, was, I think it, it happened to be a defining moment in my life, but that does not think entails my whole whole life experience. You know, I was for 30 plus years, I was in the sales or sales management role and traveled extensively, have a wife and four kids. You know, it was did pretty well. You know, we were doing our thing and we achieved what we needed to achieve. I was I was fortunate to be a top producer in every organization I was. But, you know, after the miracle on the Hudson, my, my life started to change dramatically. And I think I heard my life's call when we were going down that final moment of going down the plane. So I, I got total clarity on why I was here on Earth. And, and fortunately for me, after we survived uh, that uh, situation, I I had some opportunities to take the my life a different direction I chose to chose to do that so what do you do mainly we're going to bounce around now because yep. you, you yep. got my mind going what do you mainly do now well now I mainly I, I speak you know not only about the experience but about the lessons and strategies that I and others use that day I do workshops for organizations I write books I got well, my latest book out it's called Moments Matter and then we're doing some different things around coaching and, and online and personal so I'm I get the opportunity to not only interact with people here locally but all around the world and, and share those lessons and strategies I learned and employed that day. Okay. The reason I ask you that is before the show, I told you that I have gotten emails lately from people uh, a lot about purpose and wanting to find purpose. 
And a lot of times I find people don't come into that either later in life or they have a shift in their life where things happen like you did that leads them a different direction. But what I love about the Lord is he always prepares us. So it wasn't just like you're doing this now and you didn't have preparation before, correct? That's correct. Okay. So let's go into some of your back history of your journey of getting to where you're at now. And then that defining moment where you thought, man, this is what I'm called to do. And this is what I'm going to do and how you made that shift. Okay. So yeah, I, and I agree with you, John. I think uh, one of the things that I tell people is those who have the humility to prepare will have the confidence to execute on it when that moment comes. And I think uh, my life was a total representation of, of preparing for not only that moment of what my mission on this earth was and is. Okay. So when you say preparing, were you purposeful? On what you were doing? Because I would guess that you had no idea the direction you were going to go. You've just kind of followed what you were naturally good at in your gifts in the past, right? Or Yeah, well, I, you know, I always, when I first got into sales, John, one of the things that I did, my, my first mentor, you know, Bill told me is, you know, invest in yourself. So I, I started investing in myself and personal development. And my wife thought I was crazy because we were starting having kids and all those things. And here I am going off on a on a tangent, going on these personal development uh, sessions that I'm doing. But that's that's how I started preparing myself initially for business. But then it started getting more for my personal life. And then, of course, course, as you get more involved in it, you start learning more about, you know, why am I here? Start asking some different kinds of questions. And of course, if you ask different questions, you're going to get different answers. And that's that's how it sort of blossomed for me. So I, I think I was preparing my entire business career. And of course, you know, I, my book Moments Matter talks about, I realized all these moments in our life do matter because some of the things in my in my childhood came to play that day on the Hudson River, and which you never think it would happen, but it did. Yeah. I like what you said you were purposeful about self-development. I think so many people don't realize. What I've noticed is, I think on average, I read a statistic that most people after they graduate high school never like read maybe one book a year, if that, which is really sad because that means we most people quit developing that learning. What would you say to those people as far as that? Because you said you pursued that and you were growing. Right, most definitely. And, you know, I, I'd be very candid. After I got out of high school, through college, you know, I did what I had to do, but I really didn't read unless I had to read. But what I started finding out, my first, I referenced my first mentor, Bill. He he was somebody who who took me under his wing and candidly gave me some of these life lessons that you, can, you can't pay for. And he kept telling me the greatest leaders in the world read, and whether they read books or magazines, they always are keeping up on, on these things that they can improve, prove themselves. So they are, they're ready for their moment. So I started reading books again, you know, when I started back into the sales world and sales training because, hey, Bill said this is how the great leaders and great people do it. Obviously, I'm not there yet. They know something that I don't know. So I better get on the on the bandwagon and start reading and start educating myself. And, and But I took a different path, too, because back then is when you had cassette tapes. Yeah. And so I said, you know, I'll get the crypt notes and the cassette tapes. So I'll get the auditory and the reading. So that's how I did it. And what Tony Robbins teaches everybody and taught me is compressing decades into days. I needed to compress time. So the way I could do that is I could be in my car listening to tapes, getting books, reading, listening to books and, and catching up that way. I'll never forget one of the first mentors I had. I was early 20s, a successful. We owned a health food store and this successful real estate agent would come in. Uh, yeah, not real estate, I'm sorry, insurance. He offered to mentor me, really cool guy. And I just never forget, he brought in a bunch of cassette tapes. And I remember thinking back then, these are old, but it was Think and Grow Rich. Yep. And uh, and I remember getting that. I still laugh thinking about that back yep. then. So, I, second book I had was that. The second book I wrote was Think and Grow Rich. So you did sales for 30 years, and then let's move forward a little bit. What do you jump into next? So, you know, I was in sales doing pretty well. And then the miracle on the Hudson happens and a lot of, a lot of opportunities were started opening up for me, but I still had to make a living. So I kept in sales, but I started doing some public speaking because uh, I was asked to do it not only by my church and some other churches here around where I live, but also for the American Red Cross. And then fortunately for me, when I was spoke at the American Red Cross National Convention in Washington, D.C., somebody who was a, an agent up in Washington, D.C., a speaking agent, heard me speak and asked me if he could represent me in the business world. And that's how I started branching off, but I still had the day job. So, uh, you know, and I still was headed 
of security for Tony Robbins. So I had to give some things up. So first thing I gave up was when Tony and I came to an agreement that, uh, you know, he needed to have a different person who can commit 100 percent back to him. He encouraged me to go off my path because he always, always told me that I need to have my own job. I had to have my own company. So he really encouraged me to do that. And that's how I got into speaking. And then about three years ago, my wife gave me permission to do this full time. Okay, I love what you just said, and I'm excited about this because you had to make a transition. So you're doing sales, working for Tony Robbins, but then you an event happens in your life and you kind of start moonlighting on the side. And how did you make that transition? So how did you do that? Because I think so many people at whatever age find purpose and they're like, either one, I've seen this happen where they just completely jump ship and they go and then they just crash because um, they can't make the money and they don't find that balance. But how did you make that balance and how did you work that out? Well, yeah, that, that was one of the greatest lessons of my life because one thing from my time with Tony, and I traveled with him for 10 plus years around the world, and this is a little bit of a backstory because this, this will tell you how I got to where I am. Every time I'd pick him up at the airport or the helipad, one of the first questions he'd always ask me is, am I still working for that company? Because he said, if you're still working for that company, you're not free. You got you to have your own business. You got to do your own thing. And there's only so many excuses you can make up, right? I mean, it's just, you know, after a while, it's all, this, this, does, this doesn't resonate. But he always encouraged me to do that. So when it came time to do that, you know, I was I had some fear, right? I mean, it was it was fearful that, you know, we're going to give up this nice income, standard health care, the whole thing. Here, I'm going to go do this. But I knew the one thing I had faith in is myself that I could drive revenue because I was a sales guy. I could always drive revenue. And one of the things Tony ta- told me right, right when we were sort of, uh, you know, he was transitioning to a new person and I was tra- trying to help him get that person was he said when you're going to do this you got to burn the boats you got to do it just go all in and he said you got to commit and do not look back so uh, i that's exactly what i did and but i you know i had some challenges john i mean everybody's got challenges and the challenge i had is i went in this thing backwards where i could drive revenue all day long but i just didn't figure out how to do all the administrative things you got to do to run a business which was hard which I got into a pickle because, you know, here I was driving, but I wasn't collecting. I wasn't paying. There's a lot of things I had to put. So it took me a little while to figure it out. But Tony told me, he said, burn the boats. And so when I tell, when I teach people who want to be a speaker or want to go out on their own, I tell them, I say, yeah, you, have, you better have some savings, but you better have the commitment, not only from yourself, but also your spouse, or your significant other. Because if they're not all in, it's going to be torture. And you probably won't make it because you'll, you'll always be looking over your shoulder. I'm just curious. You said Tony would ask you if you're still working for that company. I'm guessing there's some sarcasm there. Were you a third party contractor or were you working directly for him and he was just being sarcastic? No, I was, you know, I would, I, I was a 1099 associate. I was heading his security. So I was managing all that part of his business for him, the security team and his security around the world. So, but no, he was, uh, he was very, he was very, Candid, he was with candid with all of us. That uh, you know, we you know, we I should be working for a company. That you know, he he never worked for a company. You know, this is the only thing time he ever got paid by somebody was by Jim Rohn, and when Jim Rohn paid him, it was ten ninety nine. You know, he got gotcha. to sell stuff. So that was his that was his mindset, which he imparted you know shared with me. Okay, so how long did it make make you? How long did it take you to make that transition going from? So, do you felt called? Did you feel like that was a natural fit for you speaking? I mean, had you spoken before, or did you have to start working on that skill as well? Because sales is a little bit different. I I do sales every day. I get that, but to stand up in front of people and talk, it is a little easier. There is a, a somewhat of a natural transition, but did you have to work on that? Almost definitely had to work at it. It wasn't something that I had ever thought that I would do. I, you know, I'd be with Tony and see him on stage and how he could move people, but it wasn't something that it was that I had in my game plan. It wasn't. I never thought that I'd do this. So I, what I did is, you know, I went back like we talked about before some of my personal development tapes. I went back and listened and read a little bit about what Zig Ziglar did back in the '60s to get himself going. And his strategy was he did, he did his first hundred talks for free so he could hone his technique and perfect his performance. So I said, you know what? He did it. He did it pretty well. And so the first 74 times I spoke, whether it was what's for Chamber of Commerce, the church, the Red Cross, for a company, whatever it was, I did it for free or just for expenses only because I needed to hone my technique and, and perfect my performance. And like I told somebody the other day, you have to earn the right to ask for money. You know, and I, at that point, I had not. 
I don't think I had earned the right to say somebody needs to pay me $10,000 to go speak because I, I wasn't that good yet. I wasn't there yet. And so, like I said, the first 74 t- times I talked, I received nothing. And that helped me tremendously because it was all on me to be able to, to step up and do it. So I like that also that you said, you know, you honed that gift. What else did you do? So you talked for free, but did you take – and the reason I'm asking these things is because all of us have a natural – gifting from the Lord, but we need to work on them. So you're speaking for free, but what else are you doing? Are you taking some training classes, reading? What else were you doing to hone in that gift? Yeah, I was I, one of the things that I did and, and one of the strategies that I always I learned not only from Tony, but Tom Hopkins and Jim Rohn, all the different tapes is, you know, modeling is the fastest way to get any results you want. And so I was going out and speaking with other speakers, modeling what they did. How did they do it? How did they present? So you know, my training was basically I, I don't I took one class on how to do it, but Kaylee, I didn't get a lot out of it. So I started networking with other speakers and then watching them and learning from them on how they did it and how they move people on the business side of the equation. It was an invaluable experience because I think, you know, we're all, you know, I think God opens pathways for everybody. He opened a pathway for me and it was my job to figure out that pathway in the, in the quickest and fastest way so I could Im- impact people's lives. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Man, I just drew a complete blank. I'm sorry. So let's go a little bit into leadership. So you talk about leadership. We spoke a little bit about yeah. Jesus and leadership previous. So now you're making that transition. You're going and talking. Let's let's jump into that leadership a little bit and what you do there. So yeah, one of the, one of the themes that has been resonating and you know, when I started you know, talking and speaking is that pretty much everything that I talk about is about taking personal leadership or leadership in a team. And we started putting the pieces of the pie together, my team and I, is like, and thinking through, you know, all these lessons that I talk about, whether it's from the plane, whether it's in sales, whether it's when my church experience or my or my my time with Tony, it all ties back to how to not only step up and lead when you're given the opportunity to lead, but these lessons and strategies on how to lead. In focus because one of the great experiences I've been able to have, and I'm very blessed and privileged and humbled, is I've been around great leaders. And from whether it's you know whether it's a Tony, whether it's General Norman Schwarzkopf, whether it's a Captain Sullenberger, I've been had the opportunity to meet many business and military and personal leaders, and I've gleaned off of them um, you know some of the strategies that they've used. So everything I talk about is around really building a personal leadership. And one of the areas, John, I'm finding right now, especially is in, when it comes to the millennials and Gen X group, they're looking for people. They want to be leaders and they think they can fast track that. And one of my messages to them is to train them. Yeah, you got to earn the right to lead too. You just can't say, okay, one day I want to be a leader and all of a sudden you're a leader. You got to earn the right. And so seek out somebody who's done it, who's walked the talk, who's been in that situation. Like we're seeing right now down in Texas, you see leaders step up just like they did that day on the plane. Just like you see in any situation, leaders step up. And one of, the, one of the strategies I tell people, and it's not, not, not I'm not the first guy to come up with, is, you know, those, all of a sudden the leader is the one who becomes in the most uncertain times gives the most certainty. And that person all becomes the leader, whether that's the janitor or whether that's the CEO of the company. It doesn't matter. And I can show you thousands of examples on how that happened, especially that day on the Hudson River. And that's why I talk about leadership. I'm laughing. This guy one time told me, he said he was a 20-year overnight success. Yep. And there's so much truth to that it, when you said that, because a lot of times people think, oh, well, who is this guy, Dave Sanderson? He popped up out of nowhere or something like that. People think those things or business. I see it all the time in business. But what people don't realize is there is years and decades sometimes of people preparing for the place that God has for them until they get there. Well, that's, exa- that's a great talk because if you saw the movie Sully, what you said you did, you know, Captain Sullenberger says you know, it took him 40 years for 208 seconds where his life is defined, right? And yeah. I wrote a blog about, about Esther in the Bible. I think you know people come for their moment in time. There's a reason God puts you in that moment in time. And he puts Sullenberger there. He put me there. He puts people where they need to be for that significant, that, that specific moment in time. I think it's important what you just said. Every single person. Uh, well, I'll just ask you this flat out. Yeah. With you training people and what you've seen, would you say that every single person around you has a purpose, whether they know it or not, to step into? 
Well, I think everybody on this on the earth has a purpose. And one of the things that I talk about, John, is everybody in their life. It doesn't matter whether who you are. And it doesn't matter you're the queen of England or you're the the guy who's you know cleaning toilets. Everybody's going to have what I call that personal plane crash in their life. That moment in their life when the decision is going to have to be made. You're going to have to step up. And it's how do you face and respond to that moment? Because none of us get through life unscathed. God puts us here to you know for our mission. And sometimes the mission is you know is not clear, and you have to go through that personal plane crash in your life to find out what your mission is and what that or, or better said what that the purpose in life is and get clarity of that purpose. Okay. I usually ask people like kind of a moment in their life that was defining or like that they've gone through that was really hard and what God did on the other side. But man, we can completely, this is relevant, obviously. I would love to know, take me through that day going down in a plane because I just can't even wrap my mind around the thought of hearing over the air, uh, prepare, we're going to crash, and then knowing we're going into a river. So, uh, if you don't mind, why don't we jump into that? Because that was obviously a defining moment for where you're at now. It was a it was a defining moment. I don't think – hopefully it wasn't the defining moment. Yes. yes, it was a defining moment. I'll rephrase that, yeah. Dave. I totally agree. Yep. We're gonna, we have a lot yep. of those in our life, but this is one stepping right. stone for you. Yep, most definitely. Well, nothing extraordinary about the day, John. You know, I was the last passenger off the plane. It wasn't by design. And I was not supposed to be on that plane. I was supposed to be scheduled to be on a five o'clock flight because I, I was always scheduled the last flight out because you never know in business, you know, how your day's going to go. So, you know, I really believe God wanted me on that plane for a reason. You know, because I wasn't supposed to be on that plane. I was in seat 15A. Once again, nothing out of the ordinary until you hear the explosion on the plane. It was a loud explosion, so it woke me up and sort of got my attention and looked out the window. And that's why I saw fire coming out from underneath the left wing. So, you know, I knew something had happened. You know, I fly a lot. I fly over 100 times a year. So, you know, and I've been in planes that lose engines before. And Kaylee, when he started, you know, I thought he lost an engine. No big deal. But I like I tell people, I think the guy, that's where God's entrance to the plane situation came right then because no one knew that happened on the left side where I was, also up on the right side of the plane. Because I truly believe if you would have heard a bang, bang, or if people would have started panicking, people start, would start losing their heads. And then all of a sudden you have a whole different situation. But since there was one one loud explosion, I believe, and the people I've talked to thought it, it's on the other side. We, get, you know, we have another engine. We're just going back to LaGuardia. Because you felt, felt him banking. You just thought, okay, he's just turning around going back to the airport. Airport. But then all of a sudden you're seeing the river and he clears the George Washington Bridge by about 400 feet. And I tell people, he doesn't get enough credit for that that maneuver because the bridge is roughly 600 feet up. He cleared it roughly by 400 feet. So he's roughly a thousand plus feet at that moment in time. So when you looked out the window and looked down, people's faces were looking up at you and they're like, you're that close to the bridge. Oh my so God. He, you know, clearing the bridge, I think, was something he doesn't get enough credit for. But then, of course, then he goes straight into the river. So yeah, that's where I tell people there's really two whole different unique circumstances. Getting the plane down, he gets 100% of the credit. I mean, that, but getting people out was the whole team because now all of a sudden when you're in the river and he hits hard, the plane, you know, bottom, you know, strips off the back, you know, someone opens the back door, water's coming in, water all of a sudden from ankle to waist deep, depending where you were on the plane. And I was towards the back of the plane. So water was anywhere from about knee to waist deep on me at that point immediately. So as soon as you stood up, you're knee deep into water and it's 36 degree water. So, you know, all of a sudden people are moving. And the term that I used that night on CBS when I did was interviewed by Katie Couric was it was controlled chaos. And I wanted to be def- very definitive because it wasn't people losing their heads and stepping over each other, hitting each other to get out of the way. It was people were moving fast, but no one was out of sorts. Everybody was still pretty orderly, like, let's go, right? But one of the things I talk about, especially when I talk in re- when I do the church churches or religious talks, is, is one of the things that really amazed me is when some of the seats broke because of impact. It's just, it's, it's just physics, right? On impact, things are going to break. It's some of the seats broke, and all of a sudden you saw people jumping up on top of the seats, walking down the seats. And I tell people, I think that's one of the messages that I got out of this is when and you're in the most dire situation, you're you're going down, and you could not potentially get out. All of a sudden, God opens pathways up for you. And all of a sudden, he opened two or three additional pathways, and all of a sudden, people started using those pathways. And I say that's a great metaphor for life is when you think nothing, everything's going down and you can't get it can't get any worse. God opens up pathways, but you have to be resourceful at that point. You have to open your eyes. You know, you have to see that these things are opened up and take advantage of those pathways that God opens up. 
But, uh, you know, I, did, I didn't see those pathways initially. I saw people walking down seats, but I was going to the aisle. But when I got to the aisle, something happened to change that day and everything for me. As my, got my mother, who had passed away in 1997, started talking to me in my head. And what I heard is something she told me when I was a child. It was, if you do the right thing, God will take care of you. And one of the great things about my mother, John, was she never really told me what to do. She would give me choices. And, you know, hopefully I would make the right choice based on her value set. Right. But the choice I made was you help other people first because I grew up in sports and athletics and Boy Scouts where you always were worried about your team. The team had your back. You have the pe- your team's back. So that's why I went towards the back of the plane to see if anybody needed help. And I got behind everybody. And then was, if you saw the movie Sully, you'll know, remember that one elderly lady was in a wheelchair. The lady who – that actual lady was having a little difficulty getting out of her seat. So a couple ladies were trying to get her up. And moving a little bit and I was behind him sort of pushing him behind him walking behind him and that's how I started making my way up the aisle but as that was going on water was waist deep the bins had broken open because of impact some of the luggage had flown out so every time you're taking a step you had to move the luggage out of the way because you were getting hit by something that was floating in the water and all the further I could get up was 10F which was the door on the right so I was getting out to get on the wing like everybody else but I looked out there was no room on the wing for me there's no room on the boat for me so that's why I was in the plane way deep in 36 degree water for about seven minutes holding on to lifeboat so other people could get on the wing because that was the boat was floating out into the river because of the current and so that's how i got to be the last passenger out of the plane that day wow that's powerful so what was the biggest lesson for you the takeaway for that day well there, there's a lot of lessons for me that day whether if you look from the business side of the equation john it was how to manage your mind or it's called state management right when all stuff's breaking loose or how to communicate effectively there's the business stuff but the big picture thing is hope. I, and that's what I talk about. It's like, you know, when, when things look like you have no shot at all. And in that last moment, before, as we were going to the river, when you have, think you have no shot at all, this is it. I'm going to probably be going to my creator pretty soon. So I hope I have things in line. You know, hope I get things checked out pretty quick. And you have another shot. You have and you all of a sudden given, given hope. And I think that was, was the message of the day because I think there were so many negative things going on, John, in the country at that moment. There was so much negativity. People were just... This like sort of like they are today. It just this is going on, and I think God. This is my personal belief, whether you believe it or not. God put this in place to show people that I, I'm still here. When all stuff's breaking loose in your life, I, I will physically show you how the power of hope is, and I'll show you how this works. And because how how does it happen that this plane crashes? In, in a river, in the water, which is another symbol, symbolic to the church and God, water always gives life. It's, and second, in rush hour in the busiest city in the country with all the media. I mean, and it was like made for TV. So it was like, I think God put it there to make sure everybody could see I'm still here. And when times get tough, remember, if you have hope, call on me and I'll be there with you to get you through this. I love it when he shows off. Yep. <laughs> he can do it too. He can get away with it. Yeah. Yes, he can. Okay. So, Dave, what do you feel like your biggest strength is? Well, I think my, my biggest strength is really, you know, I would, I would say probably persistence, you know, not giving up. Um, I would have probably said that years ago, but I think now it's, you know, I have a strong reference for a lot of things because of what I think I've been through. And so being able to sh- show people that, you know, if you just hang in there, right, if you have faith and hang in there, you can, you can really, you know, survive anything. If you just focus and have faith. Okay. Absolutely agree with you on that. What do you feel like your biggest weakness is? Is sometimes I get I get emotionally involved. And one of the stra- one of the things I've worked on a lot, which I'm still working on, which I've, I have not mastered, is, is the power of disassociation, which is a skill set that the great leaders have, is, be, be, is disassociate their emotions from what's what's going on. I would say probably one of my biggest weaknesses, I get I associate with people's feelings pretty quickly, and I'm learning how to disassociate so I can help them in a more effective way. By being there, just like just like a captain on a, on a plane, you know, I tell people one of the skills that Sullenberger had that day was the power of disassociation. He could he had to focus in on the outcome, and he had to disassociate from everything else going on around him. And I think that was a great skill to have, and great great lesson for me is when you when you can disassociate and focus in, you can accomplish anything. I'm curious on that one. How would you apply that to business? Well, there's there are time in my business, and and I and I have to be very candid. My company that I was with sometimes would really come down on me because I would be the client advocate. I would I would associate with my client more than I would with my company's position. 
the companies I served, if you saw the companies, they would, they loved me. And they knew that I would be with them at two o'clock in the morning when all stuff's breaking loose. So I would say that I, my business, my company always would tell me to disassociate and you know, focus more in on the comp- our company's you know, perspective and outcome. But I would say also there are times when, you know, when it comes to customer service and focusing in, you're there for your customer. And I would go to battle for my customer and sometimes I would get shot down a lot from my company. But I would say if I look back, if I would, could have disassociated probably a little bit more, it probably would have helped me more in my way I could advance in the company I was with if I really, that was my focus because uh, candidly I would, I didn't was not able to do that very well when it came to my customer and advocating for them. Yeah, you know, I was thinking about too is talking about disassociating is a lot of times I think for men and it, it applies to women too, but in the work I'm thinking in sales is not taking that rejection home uh, yep. to your family and being able to disconnect there because I think it's so easy to take work home and then not cut it off. Yeah, I agree with you. And I, I had that issue for, when I first was in sales. But I, of course, I, I learned that from the great, great pros that you've got you to block it off. So one of the things I did to physically make that happen, John, and I don't know if this would help anybody listening, but, you know, I had that challenge because I would take it home and sit there and sort of brew to my chair, right? And I wasn't associating much with my family. So I built an office 75 feet away from our house. So when I leave this office where I'm sitting here today, I shut the door. I don't bring anything home with me. You know, I don't bring my cell phone in. I don't bring any work in. I'm there present with them. And that was one of the greatest things that I ever did, which sometimes, you know, you have to go back out to work. But at least when they knew I was in the house, I wasn't thinking about work. That's good, man. That's powerful. That's a great lesson for anybody to hear. I don't care who you are. So, okay. What is the biggest thing inside of you right now that God's stirring that you're excited about? Well, one, I think one of the greatest things I'm excited about right now, there's, I mean, there's so many great things happening for me and being able to reach internationally with, with when I talk my message. But I'm working with an organization now in Atlanta. It's called The Perfect Plan Today with a gentleman named Dominique Wilkins and a couple other people. And it's it's being able to share not only leadership strategies, from leadership from a spiritual perspective to the business world. And we put together this program, which is tr- a very unique program, which is getting great reviews in Atlanta and hopefully we'll branch it out. But I think that's probably one of the, the biggest things I'm excited about because now I get to not only share what happened to me, but lessons from a spiritual perspective on how to apply that to your not only business life, but your personal life. It's called The Perfect Plan Today. Check it out online if uh, anybody's interested. I'm writing that down. Perfect Plan Today, you said? Yep, dot com. Okay, so yep. what do you do, Dave? We're all called to share the gospel at one point, but not all of us obviously are called to be ministers, things like that. How do you allow what you do to share your faith with people without being what I call quote unquote religious and just being real about who you are in your faith? Well, that, that's a great, great question. I appreciate you asking that. Now, I'll, I'll give you two, two little things. Number one, when I first started speaking in for businesses, one of the first organizations I spoke to was an oil and gas conference in Atlanta. And the lady who sponsored me or was the meeting planner said, you can't say God. You can't say anything, anything religious whatsoever about your experience. It's got to be business only because we have people here from you know, who are not only you know Christians, but Jews and Muslims, and they'll get offended. So here I am. I am. I'm thinking through because I always talk about. Was that hard? That was your first talk. That was my first business talk. It wasn't my first real talk. Yeah, it was talk my first about business talk. Where I got paid, yeah, and you're getting paid some money. And here you are. You're sitting in here in Atlanta with about 300 of these oil and gas executives. So. Long story short, I'm going through it. I, I abide by what she's saying until with two minutes left. I'm like, you know, two minutes left, what you go do? Pull me off the stage. So I went for it, right? I just went for it. And, you know, the, I put a picture of God's hands holding the plane up out of the water. And she's looking at me in the back seat of the back room, just staring at me, right? Locking me down, man. It's like, uh oh, she's mad. But I get off stage. And what's, what happened was the first four people that came up to get their picture taken with me were four Muslims from Kuwait who thanked me for mentioning faith in the business because they believe they, they and their, their belief was you can't take their faith out of business. Faith no, is part of your business. because that's who you are. Everywhere you go, yeah. if you're doing sales or running a business, that's still your DNA of who you are. That's right. And she saw that and I got a picture with them. And I, that's when she understood that, you know, yeah, I, I had, you can't take the message of the bigger being, whatever you call that, out of the message. So I, from that point on, it doesn't matter who I'm speaking with. And some people tell me you can't say Jesus. So I say God. Right. So, you know, I'll modify it. But that's uh, you never could take it out because people I think right now are looking. How does this guy 
you know, can bring this whole thing together, even from a spiritual perspective. And we're talking about, you know, awareness, leadership, teamwork, because you can't take God out of the equation. Man, amen to that. Well, that's exciting. Okay, so what is a book that you would recommend for leaders? Let's just talk about your book real quick as far yep. as for our listeners. Tell me a little bit about your book. Yeah, I appreciate that. So my book, my new book is called Moments Matter. And the way that came about is a quick quick story was we had a neighbor down the street who, and they were two neighbors, two older ladies. And, you know, you're a neighbor, right? They ask you to come down and do something. You're going to help them out. And they needed help with their TV, right? So they call me. I'm heading down the street, help them with their TV. I get it done, set it up. Wasn't that difficult. They said, well, you would stay for some milk and cookies. So I'm going, who's going to turn down milk and cookies, right? From two older ladies, right? What are you going to do? Yeah. So I'm sitting, I'm sitting there, right? And I'm sort of looking at some, some of the books on their on their table there, and all of a sudden I'm noticing these pictures, and they're pictures of concentration camps. And I'm like, what are these pictures from? And they, one of them came out and said, well, we were there. And they both showed me their forearms wow. with their numbers on them. And I'm like looking, and I'm like, whoa. I said, you got to record this for posterity. She goes, no, we don't talk about it. No, I, I kept begging him, let me record this because they're not going to be around much longer, right? Right. I need to have, you need to have this. So they would not do it. So fast forward a couple of years, my assistant Vicky at that point said, you need to record this for your grandkids and great grandkids because you're not going to be around for some of that. So we spent nine hours recording every moment of that two day period from the moment I got up that morning all the way through the next day. And we're like, there's some lessons in here that can be in a book. And when we were talking about well, what's it about, it's like, I said, this is what I realized everything that I did in my life led up to this moment. And all those moments really did matter when it came down to it. That's how the book Moments Matter came about. And we put it together and got it out. And it's been tremendously received. And I'm very honored that uh, people uh, want to read not only the story of that day, but these lessons and how you can apply those to your everyday life. And that all these moments from like when I was a kid, you know, and I'll, I'll give you a perfect quick example. You know, I never thought about this till we were writing the book. Is that when I was in Boy Scouts, I did this thing called Order of the Arrow. Mm-hmm. And if you're a Boy Scout, you know what it is, right? They basically yep. put you out in the middle of no place, right? You got you got to do these tasks, and uh, while you're doing that, you got to whittle down an arrow, and you got to keep your mind going, right, uh, for about two days. And I was 13, and my dad dropped me off. It was in Delaware, Ohio. He dropped me off at the Boy Scout camp. And said, "Here you go. I'll see you on Sunday, right?" And I'm by myself. And one of the things we had to do, John, was we had to cross a river with our backpacks, get to the other side so we could do the next task. You know, so I had to swim across the river and with my backpack on. And I said, you know, maybe that moment was just to prep me for that day because I had to jump in the water that day on the plane and swim in my clothes to get to the ferry, the rescue boat. Maybe that moment right there was teaching me, you know, you can do anything when, you know, if you have to swim, you swim, you have to have clothes on, you have to have backpack. You had to. So maybe these moments like that all added up to allow me to do what I did that day. Absolutely, man. I, I couldn't agree with you more. I believe that the Lord totally defines our steps like stepping stones as we get to different paths that we can look back and say, oh, yeah, kind of connect the puzzle. So, Dave, I ask every guest this question. I want to ask you, never skip it. And it is, if you could go back to the younger you, what would you tell yourself at what age? Now, nothing can change for the future. You're not going to change your destiny or anything you're going to go into, but you're going to give yourself some advice for what you're going to go through in your life. What age do you think and what would you say? Well, of course, if I'm looking back now, I'd want it as early as I possibly could. So I would probably say when I was in my youth somewhere between probably 10 and 15, because I think that's when you can start putting things together. But I would say, you know, pay attention to what's going on and the people around you and what they're telling you. And do not shut people down. Because I think if I would have had a mentor back then giving me these these tidbits of information that I got when I was 23, 24, 25, oh, man, I, would, I could have taken this a whole different direction. But I would say pay attention to these people who have the wisdom. Find that mentor and let the and just don't question it. Just do it because you never know where that pathway may take you. Absolutely. Okay. Right before we jump into parting thoughts, I'm going to take a moment real quick for our sponsor, Dave. All right, Dave, we're back in I want to ask you this as we leave. What advice would you give to our audience as we depart today? Well, I would say, number one, invest in yourself. You're never too old to learn. 
I do something every year. I got and one of the things that I learned back when I started this personal development plan was make a personal development goal every year. So I put a plan together every year of attending other people's material, other people's content, other people's seminars, so I can open my mind up. So don't stop investing in yourself. And second, I would say for people who are getting to that point in life where they start questioning, where, why am I here? You know, I've made my money, but I'm not really happy. You know, I work with an organization in Dallas called Halftime. And it's about how do you take your life, you know, and what you've done and be able to do it and live out your mission of your of your life for the rest of your life and really not only enjoy, but also hopefully make some money at it and add value to other people. So I'd say, you know, it goes back to that. Don't stop investing in yourself. Seek out people who have got the outcome you want. And they will, uh, they were probably more than happy to help and share that information with you. Man, love that advice. Okay, so Dave, if I am listening to the show right now, my audience is checking you out. How, where do we find your books? How do we book you? If somebody wants you on another podcast, come speak to us. Man, give us the lowdown of where you're at and how to find you. Well, thank you for this opportunity, John. Thank you for having me. Number one, go to my website, DaveSandersonSpeaks.com. You can contact me there and you can get a lot of information about me there, but also Facebook, uh, Dave Sanderson Speaks. That's where I, you'll find out where I'm going and what's going on. LinkedIn is a David Sanderson. That's where I sort of give these, these tidbits. And I write a blog twice a month about some of these thoughts that we've been talking about, but Twitter is Dave Sanderson too. But those are the best ways to get a hold of me. But one thing I've set up is I don't have any filters on my website. So you can you can come straight and get to me. And if you see that I'm going to be speaking in your city, text me or email me, and I'll be more than happy to invite you to be my personal guest at one of my events. And I like to offer your folks, you know, John, is if they if they text seven nine seven nine seven nine and put brace number four the word impact. I'll send them the first video of my new video series uh, as a gift to say thank you for checking and checking it out because this this video series will be going out later this later this fall, and uh, they I will give them the access to the first video so they can sort of check some this out. I think it's going to be the first one's about certainty, having certainty in your life. Love it, man. I appreciate you doing that for our guests, Dave. Guys, definitely uh, check that out. Brace for impact. Get Shoot the text out. So, Dave, as we wrap things up, hold on just a second. And thank you so much for having you. Roar Nation, thank you guys for jumping in. I hope you guys enjoyed that as much as I did. We will have all of Dave's links, connects on the show page. So it'll be on the front page of areyoureal.org. And also, don't forget, check out my new book, DIY Remodel Your Life. So, Love you, Roar Nation. Remember, be real, be authentic, and be you. God bless. That's all for this episode of Are You Real? Finding the Authentic You. Be sure to go to areyoureal.org for your free questionnaire to identify your gifts and talents and how you can use them to help people become leaders and catapult them into their destiny to help others become the leaders of tomorrow. We appreciate you spending your time with us and look forward to helping you reach out and revolutionize next time on Are You Real? Finding the Authentic You.